Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2. I appreciate all of that. Appreciate those testimonies. That's good. That's God's people telling it from their heart. And I'm going to give a second witness uh, maybe to some things this morning and, and hope this, this is a word that came to me this week. And um, I prayed about it and it just seemed like God would want me to preach this this morning for whatever reason. But let's get into the scriptures this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Paul says this, now thanks be unto God, and I want you to pay attention to your Bible, and believe the words that it says. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Now, if God says to you, you always triumph in Christ. Does he mean always? Even in the day where you thought you were at your very worst, God or Christ was triumphing in your life. Christ was using that to defeat something or to do away with it or to purge or whatever it was. On your worst day, God is at His very best. And you are triumphing on your worst day in the world. You're triumphing because of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Christ never lost a battle. I'm sure the disciples thought so when they were nailing Him to that cross. Uh, we sort of get a glimpse of what was in their mind and in their heart. Peter, after the death of Christ, he says, I go a fishing. I'm going back, going back to the way things were. He had no idea that Christ was going to do in him what Christ did in him after the crucifixion. And I'm here to tell you that when it looks the darkest, when it gets the worst, when uh, you are at your worst, God is at his very, very best. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is when Paul talks about that thorn in his flesh. He asked God, surely God would want this thorn away from me. Surely God would want to take this thorn out of my flesh. Surely that's God's will. And it wasn't God's will. God said, I'll just give you grace. How's that? Grace is better for you than sometimes removing the thorn. And God always knows what's best for us. Somebody say amen. Amen. See, I knew, I'd heard that story. I knew when she talked about that man holding her head up, I knew I'm going... Tell, tell him what happened to that man. He's gone. Amen. You read Psalm 91, you'll figure it out. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in how many places? Every place. You know what that means? You smell like God. You smell like a sweet sacrifice unto God. You smell like that. You are a sweet savor unto God and unto this world. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. You smell like God's Son, Jesus Christ. If you know from the law, there was an anointing oil that the Levite priests were supposed to, uh, they were supposed to make up and it was for the anointing of the high priest. And God said... If I ever catch anybody except the priesthood in their duty wearing this particular oil or smelling like this, I'm going to kill them. And what that is, it's a picture of God's salvation in us. And there is a way to tell who really is and who really isn't. And God said, if you're not my my people, my priest, and you smell like that, you're a fake and you're phony and I'm going to kill you for it. I mean, God was serious about this. He just said, I don't want anybody to mix it up. I don't want anybody wearing it. And that's what I think is involved in this. We are unto a God, a sweet savor of Christ. We smell like Christ to God. In them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. This is why lost people don't like being around us. Because they know we believe in a hell. They know we believe in uh, eternal life. They know we believe in God's judgment. They know that we believe that God judges sin and God offers salvation. They don't want any part of it. And they say in their mind about us, they smell like death to us. I don't want to be around them. 
And if you've ever smelled death, you know that's not a smell to be around. But that's why lost people don't like you anymore. That's why lost people don't want to be around you anymore. They don't want to come to your family get-togethers. They're not coming to your church with you because you smell like death unto them. But to those who are saved, to the other, the savor of life and the life. You smell like life. Amen. And who is sufficient for these things? In other words, who, who deserves this? None of us. God's given it to us. Now verse 17 is where I'm going. For we are not as many which corrupt what? The Word of God. That amazes me, uh, Emily, that when your husband gave you a King James Bible, you said, this is it. This is it. I don't know how, I don't know why. This is what I've been looking for my whole life. And I guarantee you, you go to any church in this town, most of them, and ask them if they use the King James in their services anymore. No, we don't use that, but people don't like that. They don't understand it. That's old English, and it's not really understood by people nowadays. We use the modern versions, this and that and the other. Listen, I'm telling you, when you hear somebody give Bible verses, and you hear them give King James Bible verses, you know, you know that's the Word of God. We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now, I want to talk to you this morning. I don't know how long ago. We, I got a lot of verses. You know me. I always plan. I'm, I'm always afraid I'm going to run out of verses to preach on. So I've got a lot here. I just couldn't let any of them go. But I want you to think about this morning the corruption that exists in this world. If I were to ask you, do you believe that most of the churches in this area are corrupt? Do you believe that? Most of the Bibles, I'm talking about the NIV, New American Standard, English Standard Version, Holman Standard Bible, that's the Southern Baptist one. The St. Joseph edition, that's the Catholic one. Are there people who have corrupted the Word of God? We had a man come to our church down at Richwoods. His dad was the deacon down there. And he had had a problem with drinking. And him and his wife come to the altar one Sunday. And they seemed to have got things straight. After about six months, I was teaching Sunday school class. And he popped up and said, you know, I believe you can do anything as long as it's in moderation. I knew what he was saying. He was saying, I believe I can drink as long as I do it in moderation. What does a moderate drunk do? But that's what he was getting at. He was corrupting the Word of God to suit his sin. That's done in a lot of places. It's even done in so-called fundamental churches that are King James only, they will corrupt it to match their doctrine. They'll change it or alter the meaning of a word or alter the meaning or interpretation of a verse in order to suit what it is that they believe. They will corrupt the word of God. Uh, if I were to ask you, do you believe that most politics in this county, in this state, in this country, are they corrupt? What about banks are banks corrupt sure they are what about big businesses small businesses small businesses can be corrupt too uh, basically there's not anything in this world that the devil has not put his hands into to corrupt it and turn it into something that is absolutely worthless and useless nothing uh, the idea of marriage between one man and one woman, has that been corrupted? You was telling me what before the service, Brother George? How many different genders? 93. Chickens, no better than that. Monkeys, no better. Dogs, no better than that. Give me that stuff. All of these things have been corrupted 
by the corruptors and the corruption that exists in this world. My body and my flesh is corrupt. It's why God doesn't want anything to do with it. My body, my flesh, this what you see here is corrupt. It is beyond repair. It turns everything into corruption. And there's no getting around it. And I look forward to the day when God removes me from this vile body to be made in the image of His glorious body. Somebody say amen. So I just want to speak to you this morning about the corruption that is in this world, what it entails, what, how, how, it, how it comes about. And I guess, I guess to warn everybody, don't let the devil corrupt the goodness that God has given you in your life. You pray for me this morning. I feel great. I have no idea how to preach this message. Yes, ma'am. Turn the microphone up. When I heard Emily stand up this morning, I, I bet I've been coming here and I've known her, but I've never heard so many words come out of her mouth. Yeah. That it has touched my heart. Yeah. And I want to say that I love your preaching. Don't get me wrong, but what she just did this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand this morning. I believe in that. Amen. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Amen. I, I, Lynn, I appreciate that. I do. I appreciate that. Is it my turn now? All right, okay. Let's pray. Y'all. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Y'all pray for me this morning, okay? Father, I want to come to you today, Lord, and I want to say I'm sorry for not spending enough time in prayer for this message, for these people, for this service, for all the folks that are watching online. I just took it for granted. It seemed like you gave me a good message, and I believe it is. Well, Lord, I don't, I don't feel your power. I don't feel your strength to be worthy or to be able to preach it this morning. And Father, that's my mistake. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would not, um, you would not afflict any of the people, Lord, that are here or that are watching or listening either live online or will listen to this later on. God, that you would not pass judgment upon them. Lord, it's, it would be my fault. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would teach me to pray more and not just take your blessings for granted. Lord, I know you bless every single day that I'm alive. You have moved me in ways, God, I just, it overwhelms me sometimes. But Father, I'm guilty of just taking too many things for granted. Father, I want to thank you for my wife. She's always been there for me, good or bad. For my family, my children, they've always been there for their daddy good or bad. For all my grandchildren, Lord, oh, I love them so much. I want to thank you for these, my friends, my brothers and sisters here inside this church house. And for all of those, Lord, that I know that are watching online and all the people, Lord, that I don't know. Lord, you remind me every now and then by somebody that will call and they'll say, Pastor, we just wanted to tell you, you have no idea how many people you're reaching. And Lord, I, I do. I, I'm guilty of taking that for granted. So in a way, I guess I'm guilty of the very thing, Lord, that I'm preaching this morning. Is that I, nobody is above it and neither am I above being corrupted. 
So, Father, I pray, dear God, that in humility, sincerity of heart, Father, that I would preach this message to me first, and then, Lord, to my family, then to all the good people that are here and all the good people that will listen today and in days to come, including all the people that listen in Kenya. I pray, dear God, that you would bless this message, not because of me, but in spite of me. Thank you, God, for the privilege and the blessing of being allowed to stand behind your pulpit and preaching your word, because none of it is mine. It's been handed down to me as a gift. And Lord, I hope, dear God, to be able to present it to all of those who are faithful and present it in a faithful way so that the younger generation coming up, Lord, one of these days, somebody is going to fill this spot here behind this sacred desk. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that they carry on the spirit and the ministry and the message that you have given to this church. In that, Father, we believe in one book only. So, Father, stir up our hearts, warn us of things that can happen, and, Father, show us the blessings of those, Lord, who stand true to the end. I ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people and myself will say amen to that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Some places that we're going to go to just sort of to set up the idea. Uh, Paul said one of the most important things there in 2 Corinthians is that we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. I have been um, preaching here lately on, on the uh, Watchman broadcast uh, concerning the Catholic Church, and I'm amazed at the number of times that God speaks in His Word to not bow to idols, not to make images, not to make uh, statues, not to make anything like that. Don't, don't even make them, he said. Then he said, don't worship them, don't pray to them, don't bow to them, don't reverence them, don't serve them, don't think that you're just, uh, that they're just uh, to put in our mind uh, the image of somebody in heaven because I, I, I ask this question, who knows what Mary looks like? And yet, if you type in, go to Google Images and type in the Virgin Mary, you're going to get a thousand different looks of what somebody thinks Mary looks like. And I guarantee you, she don't look like any of them. And it's all supposed to be this real pretty woman. She probably had a mustache. You never know. Okay? And images of Jesus. Nobody knows what Jesus looks like. You can't make an image of him. God said when I showed up at Mount Sinai, you have no idea what I look like because I didn't show you my face. So don't you make an image of me and say it's me because it ain't me. And how people can take that and, and, and corrupt it that way. And, I, and I've explained to people uh, in different ways that when, we, when you read a Catholic Bible in Exodus 20, the second commandment is there. Now, they shouldn't it make graven images. When you read the Catholic Catechism, they took the second commandment completely out of the Catechism and replaced it by dividing the tenth commandment into two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's nine and ten. They, they corrupted the word of God to allow for their idolatry. They also corrupt the word of God by adding to it the words of the popes, the words of the, of the Council of Trent, the words of the, the Vatican Council of 1963, the words of, uh, of the Magisterium or whatever, whatever councils they have in the Vatican. They alter the Word of God and corrupt the Word of God. And I guarantee it, listen, I know it for a fact that the Vatican is involved heavily in the corruption of the Bibles that are sitting in most, in fact, all Protestant churches except a few, because they have a Jesuit usually on the Greek New Testament committee saying what the Bible should really say. That Vatican has got their, their devilish hand in the corruption of the Word of God. Which is why you see what you see in this country coming out of the churches. 
churches. Brother George asked me, he said, what kind of latitude do you have, Brother Mike, when it comes to preaching against sodomy or homosexuality? I said, because I don't monetize my YouTube channel, I can say whatever I want to and say what God says out of His Word about sins like sodomy, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, uncleanness. I can preach about every one of those things and so far they don't kick me off YouTube for that. So far they don't kick me off sermon audio for that either. Bless God. But I'm telling you that the corruption of the Word of God is the very foundation of why you see sin so rampant, not just in the churches, but in this country. We were supposed to be the salt and the light of the earth. The salt has lost its savor. It is therefore good for nothing, Jesus said. Now in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul says this, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, listen to this now, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Of course, he's referring to, I guess, the people that live around us. America's full of Gentiles. We're Gentile nations that live in this country. There are Jews who live in this country. But he said, don't walk after the other Gentiles. And I would, I would also add to that, hopefully I'm not adding and altering the Word of God itself, but walk not as other Gentile churches walk. Just because a majority of what is referred to as Christianity in this country has accepted things like the Azusa Street Revival or the Pensacola Outpouring or the Toronto Blessing or the Asbury Revival, which was nothing but a, a feel-good joke just because the world accepts that as, the, as God's version of revival does not mean that it actually has anything to do with the revival of a man's soul and a man's heart where he turns his heart to God and to His Word. Walk not their way. That means don't listen to a bunch of these guys on Christian radio. Don't go to their blogs. Don't watch their YouTube videos. They're poison. And they're corrupting the Word of God. And he said, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. They preach after the vainness that their imaginations come up with. Oh, God is like this. Oh, God is like Jesus. Oh, God. And I hear, I've heard this from people since I was in high school. I just don't believe God would send anybody to, to hell. You don't know God. Apparently, you don't believe that he's the judge. And he judges all men's souls at the end of their life. And people go to hell because of the things they've done. Apparently you don't believe in the same God I believe in. Amen. Amen. In the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Where did that ignorance come from? Somebody corrupted the word of God. Because of the blindness of their heart. Who blinded their heart? The devil did who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness. Pastors, or so-called pastors in mega churches, putting billboards all over town with a man and a woman's feet sticking out the end of a bed, saying the church is going to talk about sex for four weeks straight. Oh, come to such and such center point church or whatever it is, and we'll talk about that. Listen, that is lasciviousness. That's a dirty-minded preacher that came up with that stuff. I guarantee you, he's after somebody in that church. Giving themselves over to under lasciviousness, to work all in cleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. Did Christ have a Rolex watch? Did Christ live in mansions all around the world like Benny Hinn does and like Kenneth Copeland has and like all these big rich mega pastors, does he have these houses everywhere? And you know what? That's what they preach. These guys are so stupid that they preach that Jesus was so rich on this earth. That's why he had to have Judas as the accountant to count up all the money that he had coming in. See, they make that stuff up out of their mind. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. How many of you got an old man hanging on you? Raise your hand and say amen. I don't like him. The old man which is corrupt 
According to the... Notice the phrase here, deceitful lust. You know what that means? That means sin will cause you to believe false doctrine. Why is it that back in the 80s, we knew that all the sodomites went to the Metropolitan Community Church. That was the gay church, and they had one just about every big city. And all the homosexuals, sodomites, lesbians, LGBTQ plus 93 others would go to that church. But now, in this time, they know they can go to practically any church. Feel welcome. Feel honored. Get married. Teach a Sunday school class. Help out with children's church. They know that because the churches have corrupted themselves according to deceitful lusts. They know that that pastor and that congregation has let sin corrupt their doctrine and their mind. And I guarantee you, if you've got a pastor or a pastorette standing behind the pulpit saying that homosexuality is the way God made them and it's okay as long as they live celibate or it's okay as long as they're married or it's okay under these conditions and everything's fine and God will bless that, I guarantee you that pastor is using that as a way to justify his own perversion in his self, in his, in his flesh. That's how you can tell. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you get renewed in the spirit of your mind? Open the Bible back up and read some more. Read another verse or read the same verse again. Read it over and over until you got it memorized, till you got it established in your heart, till you know it. Read it. Or have someone else read it for you. Or listen to the, uh, the Spirit-led, Spirit-filled preaching of God's Word. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There is a holiness and a holy way of life that only comes through God's Word. Your old man will fight it tooth and nail. Your old man will come up with reasons why it's allowed to sin and get away with it. Your old man will come up with reasons why, well, the Bible says that, but it doesn't really mean that. Or the original Greek says something different. Or the original Hebrew says something different. Or God doesn't do this anymore. I heard that from somebody here a while back. They, they, they were going to Assembly of God Church and they had women preachers up there. And he, he just went to his pastor and he said, Pastor, he said, I got a problem here. Will you show me in the Bible where God allows women preachers behind the pulpit? And that pastor said, oh, that's in the Bible, but God doesn't do it that way anymore. That was for them back, way back then. Listen, he's the same God yesterday as he is today, and he's the same God tomorrow. Amen? That's why, that, that's why this book has not changed in over 400 years. It won't. Amen? Genesis chapter 6. This goes all the way back to the beginning. Look at, look at what it says now. You know what? I, I, I'm starting to get the gist of where God is taking this. If I'd have prayed about it more last night, I probably would have got it last night. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations. Generations. I'm saying it that way on purpose. They mean to change everybody's genetics. You believe that one? Oh, I do. I think you and I would be absolutely disgusted to the point of being sick to our stomach if we could see what has been accomplished in laboratories around the world as far as mixing animal genetics with human. We already know they've mixed human DNA with chimpanzees. We already know that they've mixed human DNA with cattle. We already know these things. I think there's worse in places all around the world. And just, you know, just me talking about it, it makes me sick to my stomach. 
That is an aberration in the eyes of God and an abomination. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his what? His genetics. His generations. He was exactly the way God made Adam. His genes were still made by God. But we know also from Genesis 6 that there was a whole race of people on the earth whose genes had been manipulated by the sons of God. They were called the giants. Uh, Noah was perfect. He was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt for all what? Flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now I'm starting to get it. It's not the monkeys. And I'm talking about the animals, not the rock group. It's not the monkeys that are going to be held accountable by God for the mixing of DNA. It's not going to be the fish of the sea that's going to be held accountable by God because of the mixing of different things into fish DNA. It's not going to be the trees. It's not going to be the birds. It's not going to be the worms or the snakes' fault. It is all going to be laid at the hands of corrupt man because that is what his flesh wants. Man wants to live now as long as he can, if not forever, and the goal is to either by technology, by genetics, or a combination of both, continue to live in hopes that they will escape God's judgment at the end of their life. They can deny it all they want to and say, we don't believe in God, therefore we don't believe His judgment, therefore we can do whatever we want to, live however we want to, believe in whatever we want to, and we can alter man's DNA so that man will evolve himself in the coming days. Man wants to do that, but it's his wicked flesh that wants it, that craves it, that wants what Eve was told in the Garden of Eden, you shall be as God's. To live forever on this earth. It is the flesh of man that will be, was responsible and is responsible for the corruption of all the ways on this earth. Man has corrupted God's version of government, has he not? Man has corrupted God's word. Man has corrupted God's church. Man has corrupted God's way of government. Man has corrupted God's way of, of, of civil laws, laws between mankind. God is, man has corrupted everything in this world. And it's not going to end until man is destroyed off of this world, like it was in the days of Noah. Let me hear you say amen. In Exodus 32, verse 7, the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down. He's up on Mount Sinai. For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. See, you can take the man out of Egypt. But that may not take the Egypt out of the man. What did they make that got God so angry? A calf, a golden calf. Where did they learn that from? Egypt. They learned it from Egypt. And I want you to think about this and I want you to have God apply this in your heart somehow, some way. God, however I used to live, even, even if you were in church, even if you were saved, God, however I used to live, if it's wrong in thy sight, change me. Change me. God, you've brought me a long way. God, you've made many changes in my life and I'm thankful. But God, I am still undone, unclean, unfinished, un unrighteous. God, whatever I used to be, take that away from me that I don't corrupt myself again. Take that away from me so that I live right in your sight. Now, I'm not talking about 
human perfection or uh, whatever doctrine they call it in some churches, the Nazarenes believe in um, Christian perfection, the sinless perfection, that once you get saved, you never sin again. That, as long as this flesh is alive, is not possible. But I can tell you that God, over the years of your life, will make things a whole lot better than they ever were. Paul said, shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? God forbid! So, Moses was aware, God made him aware, that the children of Israel, even though they had been taken out of the land of corruption, they brought the corruption with them, which is why that generation who lived in Egypt never made it to the promised land. Every one of them died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. It was only a new generation that was born in the wilderness that didn't know the things of, of Egypt that God allowed to go into the promised land. And even then, did they get corrupted when they got there? Sure they did. Deuteronomy 4.16 uh, 4, says this, Lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, image the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. And uh, down in verse 25, Deuteronomy 4, When thou shalt beget children, and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves. God didn't say, in case you corrupt yourselves. He said, you shall corrupt yourselves. And maybe, maybe we, maybe we had this idea that when we got saved, we would never want to sin again. We would never, we would never sin again. Everything would be fine. Everything would be okay. And we could just live in perfection in this life. Oh, I wish it was that way. I do. I'd be the first one to sign on to it. But any of us here know. That even being a Christian all these years, it's still possible for this old man to corrupt the ways that the new man wants to live. Y'all say amen to that? You shall have remained long in the land and shall corrupt yourselves. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say in case you do. He said you shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or the likeness of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger. And this is the second generation that came out of the wilderness. They didn't see what was going on in Egypt. They got to Canaan land and they saw what was going on in Canaan land. They said, oh, that looks good. They saw that uh, in, in some of the temples to Ashtaroth that there were uh, temple harlots for sale at the temple of Ashtaroth. And the men were going, oh, I think I like that church. I'm going to start going, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start saying that that's God's way and God wants us to do that. And they corrupted themselves. Even some of the men saw the, that some of the for sale people at the temple of Baal and Ashtaroth were sodomites. So you know what they said? Well, we'll start adding that to our religion and we will be sodomites. Now y'all know I love the Jewish people. I love them. I pray for them all the time. But one of the largest strongholds of sodomy in the Middle East is Tel Aviv, Israel. You won't even find that in most of the Arab nations. You'll find it in Israel. God said, it'll corrupt you. You'll be, it'll be like worse than if you never knew me before. Deuteronomy 32, 5, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. It wasn't the Canaanites that corrupted them. It wasn't, you can blame how you were raised. I, Emily, God bless you for saying what you said. It wasn't anybody else's fault that you were wrong except yours. 
It wasn't your mama's fault. It wasn't your daddy's fault. It was yours. We corrupted our own way. We were a crooked and perverse generation. Not to be put, not to put the blame on anybody else except where it belongs. Judges 2.19, and it came to pass when the judge was dead. This God given the history of what happened in Israel after they got to the promised land. When they'd have a judge, everything would be right. But it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. Is that not how we are right now? See, our fathers and our grandfathers, they drank whiskey and they lusted after women. They may have uh, lived in the day when Playboy came out and they, and, they, and they lusted after that. But now we're living in a generation that is far worse than that. Drugs and internet and God only knows what else. Corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. And they cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. You see the corruption coming in. You see the corruption coming into your life. Send it back away. Go tell God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. This body is earthy. It came from the dirt. What sort of high expectations do I have in dirt? None. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. That's the dual nature that we have as Christians. We have the flesh is of the earth, but we have the spirit which is from heaven. Which man do you want to live forever? And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, listen, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Which is why we have to be changed when God takes us into eternal glory. Because flesh and blood cannot inherit. And then he follows up. He says, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. And there's doctrines out there. I'm not, not going to get into all that. That actually believe. They call themselves a new breed and that God is going to change the genetics of their body and they will be God's super soldiers that will take over the world for Jesus Christ and hand Him the keys to the world. That's corrupt. That's not, it. That's not even a close good reading of the Bible. Matthew 7, beware of false prophets. How much more have I got here? Well, I got a bunch of them. I won't go, I won't go all the way. How about that? Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets. Where are false prophets to be found now? I mean, you know I'm not going to invite any of them here. Right? So where would you find false prophets if you went looking for them? Churches? Internet? A lot easier to get to on the internet. And see, you can come to church here and say, Bethel's my church. But then start listening to false prophets privately, not going to their churches, listening to them on the internet. That happened with a guy several years ago. Moved here, came here. This was his church. But then he started listening to wolves in sheep's clothing. He started listening to false prophets. Next thing I know, he's got some wild, crazy doctrines and he's trying to tell me what he believes and I'm trying to show him from Scripture that that's wrong. And he got mad. I got mad. And that was it. Because I didn't want him spreading the things that he believed inside this congregation. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. 
That's where corrupt Bibles come from. They come from a corrupt tree. That's where corrupt churches come from. They come from a corrupt tree. That's where corrupt preachers come from. They all come from the same corrupt tree. Two trees in the, in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And which one do the false prophets come from? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. You'll know them. It should be easy. Um, boy, that's what happened to the devil, isn't it? You know it corrupted Lucifer? His pride in his beauty and his position with God. He was the anointed cherub that covereth and his beauty was, he was full of diamonds, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, gold. He was just encrusted with beautiful, luminous jewels. The most beautiful angel of all of God's creation. And he stood in a special place above all the angels, the anointed cherub that covereth. He was corrupted by the pride of his beauty and the pride of his position with God. Why do you think the popes are always corrupt because they believe that they themselves are God on this earth. They take the name of God, Holy Father, to themselves and demand that everybody calls them that. And then the speeches that they come out with are corrupt. If you watch the last Watchman broadcast I did, you'll see that the popes all speak in a building that when you walk into it, it looks like a serpent's head. I'm not kidding you. I went... Yeah, with its mouth open, its fangs sticking down. I'm not kidding you. Go look at it. Yeah, it's the audience hall. It's Paul VI audience hall. Watch the Watchman broadcast, though. You'll get the good stuff on that one, all right? Let me, let me end with this. Zephaniah 3, turn there. That way, it will not be said by Zephaniah, how come you didn't turn to Zephaniah? You're going to meet Zephaniah and he's going to want to know, did you ever turn to Zephaniah or did you just listen to it? You say, no, I turned to it. I read it. I made marks on it. I underlined verses. I got verses here. Mm-hmm. Like Zephaniah 3, 9, for then I will turn to the people of pure language. Stuff like that's in there. But look at chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. Did you know that you can look pretty much throughout this world at any civilization that ever existed or exists now and see the influences of the Bible in it by how clean they are? There are places, you mentioned, somebody mentioned France. France is filthy. They've been filthy. Okay? It's because France has been run by the Catholic Church for years. God is a clean God. Is He not? Before the priest could even walk into the sanctuary, there was a brass laver there that he had to wash in before he entered the presence of God. In fact, Practically every sin in the law of God couldn't just be sacrificed for. You had to wash because of that sin. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Four things. Her princes within are roaring. Now you know where Peter got that, don't you? Be sober. Be vigilant. 
For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. And how does our adversary, the devil, roar as a lion? Through the prophets and the preachers and the princes. They're roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. I just mentioned this very quickly. One Catholic priest who became very well known for being a predator went to the Sunday school room on a Sunday asked for one of the boys to come with him during Sunday school. After Sunday school was over, that priest went out and held Mass. They've polluted the sanctuary, haven't they? They've done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof and He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth He bring His judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. Aren't you glad that God made you ashamed of things you've done? Say amen. That will keep you from being corrupt. I've cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so there is no man that there is none inhabited. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction so their dwellings should not be cut off. Howsoever I punish them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. You see, the plain truth is, God, Dave, God bless you. God had mercy on you and patience with you as you went through that time in your life that you testified about when God could have just as easily turned you over to a reprobate mind and you would still be lost in whatever sins it was and maybe even worse by now. But God had mercy on you. Emily Sink, she left. Same thing. There she is. Oh, she moved. All right, everybody switch sides now. God could have cast you off. Could have cast your husband off. But he didn't. But some people, no matter how difficult God makes their life, no matter how hard their sin is, no matter how, how uh, poor they end up, no matter how miserable they end up, no matter the depths of decadence that they turn into, God works at them. God begs them. God pleads with them. He sends people to witness to them, draw them to the Gospels. But they wake up early and immediately start in, how can I corrupt myself today? If that's you, then I can tell you, you won't be long for this church or many others. If that's you, it will take its toll on your life. The sins that you commit, the things that you do, it will have its way. It will corrupt everything about you. And God will have nothing to do with you. While God is working with you, while God is dealing with you, while God is chastening you, that's the time that you say, God, take this away from me. Or give me grace. I don't want to be this way. God, help me not to corrupt your word. When I read it and I see the things there that I'm doing wrong, help me, God, not to ignore it. Help me not to change it. Help me to live by it and admit I was wrong. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to open up these altars to you. The first person to come down to these altars, I want you to step on that wasp that's on the carpet right there. If God's dealing with you, if God's speaking to you, 
You can come down here and pray. You can stay where you are and pray. But I'm going to give you a moment to pray. In the um, nearly 50 years that I've been at this church, nearly 50 years, there you go, get him, Dave. There you go, praise the Lord. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. In the nearly 50 years that I've been at this church, as a little boy to the age I'm at now, I've seen a lot of people come in. I can say that a lot of those people still serving God, serve God all the way to their death. And I've been privileged to be a part of their funeral services. Privileged to send them forth into glory. But in the nearly 50 years that I've been here, I've seen people come in and go out worse than they ever were. See, they came in because God dealt with them. And they thought, well, maybe I need to get in church. And they got in church for a while. But worse sins crept in. And they corrupted themselves more than they ever had before. And some of them, after they left, never got another chance to come back into the house of God. One guy that I, I grew up under in this church, my dad used to rabbit hunt with him, ended up that way. He walked out, gave himself back over to the sins he had before, God gave him chances to come back and he never took them and he died. So whatever corruption is present in your life, today's the day to deal with it.